Welcome to our week two lecture on the ancient Near East. Each week I'll have a lecture on some highlights from our chapter. This week I wanted to also do an example of a thematic project presentation to give you an idea of one way to approach them. So the, in the thematic project, you're picking an idea or a theme in the chapter, in the era, and pulling one or two artifacts to give uh, some more research and more in-depth look into how those artifacts represent that idea. So in this case, I'm going to be looking at power, and I'm actually going to look at, at several artifacts, partly because I want to look at multiple perspectives in how power is represented in this culture. Um, so our genres are architecture and art, and these are the basic elements that you need to have on your title slide for your presentation. So your presentation does not need to be voiced over or recorded, and you'll see in the presentation we're about to look at that there's actually a lot of text, and that's totally fine to do your explanation through the text. I'm going to be doing both because this is an example. So in the foreground of this piece is Ram in a thicket, and I actually took this photo in the British Museum because I liked how it shows the scale of the piece in the background, which is the standard of Ur, and because uh, you can see the woman standing there. In our book, so many of these images we see out of the context and scale. So for in this case, I could see for the first time why people think that it was a headrest, potentially, right? It's kind of like a big wooden pillow. And you can also see how it's the right size to be holding a lyre, uh, an instrument. And in this piece in the foreground, Ram in a Thicket, I mean, it's clearly valuable. It's well made. It's gold. <laughs> uh, I was surprised when I did more research into this, into this piece that there was human sacrifice as part of the burial traditions in this culture. So not only were the kings buried with these emblems of their wealth, but also there was uh, human sacrifice in the grave pit. Right. So in this case, where they dug up these pieces in the Great Death Pit by uh, Leonard Woolley, a British explorer who excavated the site in Iraq in the 1920s and 30s, that there were, you know, a whole crowd of bodies from soldiers to ladies of the court. Um, everybody was still dressed in their uh, elaborate, you know, golden headdresses. There, there were <clears throat> carts with the bulls still harnessed to them and the driver's bones still in the cart. So it, in some ways it had kind of a, kind of a, a very rough <laughs> and maybe more, maybe more violent, um, theme of human sacrifice and burying kings with the kinds of things that maybe they would need in the afterlife as in the same way that we see in Egyptian culture. We don't know as much about this culture because um, we just don't have as much writing compared to, to the Egyptians. Also in this chapter, we're, we are seeing the stele of Naramson. And I had always thought that this piece was much bigger. I like actually, in some ways, it makes a lot of sense. You can see how big it would have been and how somebody would have looked at it. And you can see this man kind of looking up towards uh, Naramson, who is the, the biggest figure there in the upper left of, of the stele. And the, at this point in history, we're seeing this, um, use of social perspective or heretic scale. And you could, I think you could say that we see this today as well in a lot of pieces. So, and that's where the most important figure is represented as larger than the others and also higher up, right? So you're, you're closer to God. And um, so size and being close to God are, are elements of power. So in this case, not only is uh, Naramson at the top and the biggest, he's also closest to, to these, uh, three stars, the cuneiform symbols of the God. So they're both looking on and they're protecting him as his, uh, as he and his troops crush, uh, 
crush their enemies in battle. I love Assyrian Lamassus, and I had always heard of them as being striking or colossal, which is how they're described in our book. And so I was surprised, you know, coming from a culture today where we have things like the Statue of Liberty, that I didn't find them overwhelming. So it was it was great for me to get this perspective of, you know, just based on the on the technology and the materials that people were working at the, with at the time, like this was epic. So these Lamasu would have been at the entrance to um, to the palace, and they would have been very intimidating for visitors to walk through. Um, and also in the same exhibit, as you walk past these Lamasu, you can see one of the uh, limestone plaques in the back there in the lower right of this image, is you enter... Uh, Ashur Nasir Paul II Killing Lions, which is a series of the uh, the king striking down these lions. And it, visitors would have walked past this long, long series of them as they went to visit the king. And so they would have hopefully been, you know, completely uh, cowed by the time they got him and impressed by the time they got to him. In the thematic project area, you can also see a artifact explanation paper that I wrote about um, and assure Paul II killing lions to get some more details on on how he how he used his artists to intimidate his visitors. The Ishtar Gate is one of the most beautiful pieces from from this chapter. This is um, it was created by the Assyrian Empire in 609 before Common Era, and the Babylonian kings restored Babylon as part of the architectural masterpiece, which included the Hanging Gardens, which were once considered among the seven wonders of the world. We don't have any actual drawings of the Hanging Gardens. They're just textual descriptions of them, but we do have this gate. So King Nebuchadnezzar had the Ishtar Gate built as a key feature to the city of Babylon. And this is what you would have seen as you came into the city. I love that it's at the beginning of an avenue called May the Enemy Not Have Victory. Uh, along here, too, there are images of gods which are protecting the city, which you see in the in the brickwork here. It's just It's just beautiful. And I think in this case, I think I would agree that even in modern terms, that the architecture is epic. Darius and Xerxes also, also appear in this chapter, and we're going to come back to them a little bit when we uh, talk about <clears throat> other cultures in, in coming chapters. So um, the, the Persians had a sense that all the people in the region owed them allegiance. And what you see in this piece is as you know, as visitors are coming in to you know to pay homage to Darius and Xerxes, that they're having to walk past these panels showing them exactly how powerful you know these rulers are, and um, they'll see very distinct images with details representing how these people are coming from twenty three subject nations. So it's it's telling them both the story of the power and also. Uh, how basically they should bow down as they bring their gifts to the palace. So I hope you enjoyed our tour of some of the pieces that we see in chapter two. Again, for your presentations, you're more than welcome to explore in depth one or two artifacts, but I wanted to give, I wanted to give an an overview for this chapter, partly because we're dealing with actually a variety of cultures in chapter two, and I wanted to give you a sampling from, from them. So I hope you have a great week exploring chapter two.